And we're back, and we're going to be looking at some uh, electromagnetic induction in Faraday's law. And this will be the type where we have a, uh, a loop that's moving in a constant magnetic field. Okay, so on our picture here, uh, the magnetic field, is, there's all these dots coming out of the screen. And if we think about this, if we drop the loop through the magnetic field, um, let's see what happens with all this when we have a, an actual applied force to this. We're going to have the, the weight of this loop, correct? gravity, pulling down on it. And normally it, it would make this thing free fall. You know, if we assume we're forgetting about air friction. But um, when that front edge, that bottom edge, starts to go into the magnetic field, we're going to go from zero flux to an increase in flux. And that's where we have all this induction stuff happening. So let's draw this thing with that front edge starting to enter the magnetic field. Okay, so gravity's going down on this. Uh, we also have the, the velocity going down on this. And we have this shaded area here where we have an increasing flux as it continues to fall. So maybe, maybe this distance right here uh, we could call y, for lack of a better word. Uh, a symbol for it. So, based on what we know about induction, we have an increase in flux, and the um, because of Faraday's law, this means that a voltage will be induced and a current will be induced. And so we can ask the question, which way will the current flow? Well, the current's going to flow in a direction that will try to stop the flux from changing. In this case, stop it from increasing. So, we need to produce flux going into the screen, and you can do that if you have a clockwise current. Now, as we know, when this happens, um, the current is flowing to the left through that bottom edge. Okay, and this is the case where the, the production of this current is actually coming from QV cross B. We have moving charges going down, uh, the magnetic field is coming out of the screen, and that means that positive charges, a positive current, is getting pushed to the left, and if you have a closed loop, it'll flow around clockwise like this. But, when you have a current, that induced current in the magnetic field, that bottom edge will also feel a force. Okay, the bottom edge is feeling IL cross B now. And, in this case, if you do uh, the right-hand rule, the current's flowing to the left, the magnetic field's coming out of the screen, and that means that there's a force on this bottom edge going up. That's the magnetic brake effect. Okay, it's trying to slow down so that the flux will stop changing. Okay, Now, uh, according to Faraday's law, the induced voltage is a constant magnetic field times the change in area. We need that derivative. So we're going to take the time derivative of the area of that rectangle that's shaded here. And that is uh, the long side L times whatever Y is, the, the part that's in the magnetic field. And as, as we have seen before, the L is a constant. We're left with dy dt. And that looks an awful lot like velocity. Okay, so that, that's your induced voltage. The induced current, okay, just the, the magnitude of it, is voltage divided by whatever the resistance of that loop is. Okay? And therefore, that allows us to figure out how strong the force is on that current, okay, on that bottom edge. It's this current that we just solved for times L times magnetic field. So, um, now here we, we do need the minus sign because this force is opposite the velocity. So we're, we're going to have a V squared, L squared, all over resistance, and then here's your velocity. Now, if, if we continued with this, if that, were, if that was the only force, if we only had a braking force, um, it turns out that it's going to slow it down. And it's going to slow it down exponentially. 
Okay, this is kind of like in mechanics, this is the hockey puck where air friction is the only force acting on it. Air friction is proportional to velocity, just like this magnetic force is. Okay, um, but here, this is more like the skydiver problem in mechanics. Um, we have gravity and this velocity dependent braking force, like air friction, only it's a magnetic force. So if we do F equals MA on this metal hoop, um, we have gravity in the direction of the acceleration, and then we have this magnetic braking force trying to slow you down. So that's what F equals MA looks like. And we want to try to figure out what's going on as a function of time. That's, that's really the problem that we're after. So that means we're going to have a differential equation. I'm going to divide through by the mass, and I'm going to use our definition of acceleration, dv dt, and this is what our differential equation looks like. Okay. Now we need to separate the variables. Uh, the easiest way of doing this is to bring the dt up on the right hand side, and then we have to divide through by everything in the parentheses here. That's the only way we can get our, all of our velocity terms together. So we have all these constants here. V squared over L squared over mass times the resistance in V. And then we just have time by itself on the right hand side. Now this is what we can start to integrate. Once you separate variables, you can try integrating. The time, it's just going from whenever it first enters that magnetic field. And, you know, you let it run a, a little bit. Um, now on the velocity side, uh, I guess we, we could say that we started off with some initial speed, or we could say that we started off at rest and, and dropped it in. Um, I'm going to say that our initial speed is zero, just for convenience. Because really what, what we're after, we want to try to solve for that V final. So if on the right hand side, that's just whatever the time interval is. Okay, the amount of time that you're falling into and changing the area. And over here we're going to have natural log of everything in the denominator. I'm going to have to evaluate this from zero to whatever the final speed is. And because of the chain rule, we also get some constants out here. It's got to be the reciprocal of, of the coefficient of your velocity. Um, if we evaluate this thing, I'll move the constants over to the right-hand side. Uh, again, just to kind of clean it up a little bit. B squared L squared over mass times resistance, and there's our time. When we evaluate this on, and rewrite, I'm going to skip a line or two of algebra here. We plug in our v final, and then when we get what uh, we put in zero, that second term goes away, and we just have little g by itself. Okay. So on the left hand side, if we e both sides and simplify, we have one minus. Um, V squared L squared over mg resistance. And then here we, it's going to be exponential again. Okay. Um, we'll clean it up just a tad more. Uh, in fact, let me let me just go ahead and write down the final answer for velocity. Uh, this final speed, or your velocity as a function of time, um, we're going to have a coefficient here. And then we have uh, 1 minus e to this crazy power. Okay, this is exactly the same kind of form that we had back in the days of of air friction with skydivers. Um, the graph, velocity is a function of time. If you plug in zero for time, um, you have one minus one. Okay, so you start off at, at zero speed. That was our initial condition. 
and then this is going to increase exponentially to a constant. Okay, when, when time gets really big, that exponential term goes to zero. We have this asymptote up here with our terminal velocity. In this case, it approaches this constant, the weight times resistance divided by b squared l squared. Okay. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's really kind of cool how it works out. You, a couple little features, you know, do remember that you could take uh, the derivative of, of this solution, and that would give you your acceleration as a function of time. That would also be exponential. You could take the integral of this and find out your position as a function of time. Also remember that this only happens as, as long as it's falling into the magnetic field and the flux is changing. Okay, if, uh, if you get a constant flux, all this goes away because that voltage and current would stop and the forces would stop. So, yeah, it's kind of cool how it works. Um, uh, you know, we, we're just looking at uh, the case where area is changing. So we can use Faraday's law and get the voltage and get the current using Ohm's law. Once that current flows, you have current and magnetic field and you have IL cross B kicking in. And uh, yeah, that gives us a magnetic force which is proportional to velocity and that's why we get all this nonsense. Um, it's like air friction. So um, yeah, I should point out that in the lab, this, this is exactly what's going on with that long tube, that aluminum tube that we have. It's not magnetic and yet when a magnet falls through it, it falls at a terminal speed. This is why it's changing the flux, which is causing a breaking force, magnetic break, and it balances gravity, and that's why we get that terminal speed. So it's pretty cool. This stuff happens um, in, in different devices, and so we have this uh, electromagnetic induction to thank for all these weird effects. Until next time, we'll see you later.